or, or members get here. Uh, in this particular instance, uh, I can start, but I'm going to stop wherever we are when uh, the ranking member gets here so she can make an opening statement. Uh, good morning. I'm pleased that we can hold this nomination hearing for three very well-qualified nominees to three important positions in our government. Noel Francisco, nominated Solicitor General. Uh, he'll be the first uh, ever Asian American Senate confirmed Solicitor General uh, after confirmation. Uh, Stephen Engel, uh, Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel, an office that functions as legal advisor to executive branch agencies and the President. Macon Delorine, uh, nominated to be Assistant Attorney General for Antitrust Division at DOJ. Macon immigrated to this country when he was 10, and if confirmed, he'll be the highest ranking Iranian American official in the Department of Justice. We all know Macon because he was staff director for our friend Senator Hatch here. Uh, and as uh, former staff director, he knows, of course, what it's like to sit on this side, and now he's going to find out what it is on the other side. <laughs> so I congratulate to all of you, uh, and especially your families. I didn't welcome the families and friends of the three nominees, but obviously uh, you're very proud of them, and, and probably most of you had something to do with them getting as far as they have. Uh, so would you... Three folks uh, stand and uh, be sworn, please. Um, uh, do, do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. Each of them affirm that. Uh, will each of you very quickly... Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, we have uh, senators that are going to introduce people here. Pro proceed. Senator Graham goes first. Senator Graham, go ahead first. I'll certainly defer to Senator Hatch, but okay. Well, <laughs> you're in charge of deferring. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Engel to the committee. He went to Harvard, Cambridge, and Yale. In spite of that, I'm going to support your nomination. <laughs> Nobody plays good football at those schools, except maybe Cambridge. Uh, the bottom line is uh, I've known Mr. Engel and his uh, job uh, in the same he is deputy for the job he's seeking now of Office of Legal Counsel from 2007 to 9. And let me tell you what I can, let me tell you what I know about Mr. Engel. That he was a fierce advocate for the Bush administration. We had differences at times. We worked them out. He always did what he thought was right and ethical. I can tell you when it comes to being uh, around Mr. Engel in very controversial uh, moments that he has a reasoned, calm disposition, that he will give good and, uh, yeah. advice to his clients, that he's loyal, but his ultimate loyalty lies to the law and to a sense of fairness. So to you, the children, you should be very proud of your father. I have seen him in action, and I think the president has chosen wisely. I'm talking about somebody who I've actually interacted with under the most difficult times after 9-11. And I am sure you're ready for this job. You're one of the most prepared people the president could have chosen. So I recommend strongly to this committee that you be uh, moved forward in a bipartisan fashion because you've earned that. Senator Hatch, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing today. I appreciate you. Due to, due to committee conflicts this morning, I regret what I'll need, I'll need to excuse myself following my remarks. But I may have some questions for the nominees that I will submit for the, for the record. That said, it is my great privilege today to introduce to the committee uh, my friend and former chief counsel, Macon Dalrahim. 
who is President Trump's uh, nominee to become Assistant Attorney General for the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice. Given Macon's extensive background in both policy and intellectual property law, the President could not have picked a more uh, qualified nominee for this important post. With my more than 40 years of experience on this committee, I've worked closely with some of the most brilliant legal minds in the nation. Uh, but among them, Macon stands apart. During the several years Macon served as my chief counsel and committee staff director, he distinguished himself as an able manager, a trusted confidant, and a sharp policy mind. He executed the duties of his position beautifully and to this day remains among the most talented chief counsels I've ever hired. The White House took notice of Macon's talents and in 2003 served as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General in charge of international policy and appellate matters in the Justice Department's Antitrust Division. Having already served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Antitrust Division, he is exceptionally well qualified and prepared to serve as the Division's Assistant Attorney General today. While at the Department of Justice, Macon also served as a member of the U.S. Attorney General's Task Force on Intellectual Property, where he acted as the agency's point person on international antitrust issues. <laughs> Macon also oversaw the Antitrust Division's appellate litigation and policy development. During his tenure at the Department of Justice, he played key roles in the agency's enforcement and policy development on emerging issues at the intersection of antitrust, and intellectual property. As remarkable as Macon's professional life is, his personal history may be even more remarkable. Macon immigrated to the United States from Iran, where he was just uh, nine years old. He moved with his family to Los Angeles after the Shah of Iran was uh, deposed. Macon's success story is the American dream. He has wonderful parents. I've met them. And uh, I have to say that they come from good people. Macon displayed brilliance from an early age and was soon accepted to UCLA. After graduating, he went on to earn a master's degree from Johns Hopkins and a law degree from George Washington University Law School. From there, he embarked on an exceptional career in which he distinguished himself as an to lawmakers and presidents alike. In addition to being well-respected by people on both sides of the political spectrum, Macon is widely regarded as a national expert on antitrust and intellectual property issues. On April 24th, the chairman and ranking uh, member of, of this committee received a letter signed by 12 former antitrust assistant attorneys general, a group composed of both Republicans and Democrats. In their letter, they sang Macon's praises, stating, quote, we do not always agree on all matters relating, related to antitrust enforcement. But we do agree on this. Mr. Dal Rahim has the experience, intelligence, judgment, and leadership skills necessary to serve as an excellent assistant attorney general, unquote. Additionally, on April 21st, a letter was sent by 11 of the former commissioners of the Antitrust Modernization Commission, of which Macon was one of the commissioners. time, uh, I also wish to welcome Mr. Noel uh, Francisco, who has been nominated to be Solicitor General of the United States. In addition, we'd like to welcome Mr. S uh, Stephen Engel, the President's nominee to be Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel. Both of you have distinguished legal careers and are highly qualified for the positions for which you have been nominated. We look forward to hearing from all of you today, and I apologize that I have to leave, but I'm very grateful to have this type of quality as I announced nominated. as I announced I'll call on Senator Feinstein now and then Senator Cruz to introduce the last nominee thank you very much um, mr. Gra Senator Grassley and I want you to know I very much appreciate this courtesy and uh, to the nominees I want to apologize because this is going to be a bit aside from your nominations and also extend that apology to the families as well Last night, at approximately 5.30 p.m., President Trump called to say he would be removing Director Comey from his leadership position at the FBI. President Trump specifically stated 
that the recommendation was provided by Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein and Attorney General Sessions. He said the reason was because the department is a mess. I was obviously surprised and taken aback. Then when the official announcement was released, the White House provided three documents. One, a letter from the President firing Director Comey. Two, a letter from Attorney General Sessions recommending Comey be removed on the basis of his personal evaluation that, quote, a fresh start is needed at the leadership of the FBI. And three, a memo from Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein outlining serious concerns about Director Comey's handling of Secretary Clinton's email investigation. These letters and memo raise additional questions, Mr. Chairman. Why did the President make reference to the Russia investigation in his letter dismissing Director Comey? Was the reason for his dismissal because the Department was a mess and lacked leadership or not? If the reason for firing Comey was because of his handling of the Clinton investigation. Why now? As the night went on, more and more stories began to unfold about the events surrounding Director Comey's dismissal. The press reported that Director Comey found out about the firing through television news coverage that broke reporting that the administration had been considering firing Comey for some time and charged with building a case against Director Comey for at least a week. Specifically, the New York Times reported, <coughs> excuse me, that Attorney General Sessions had been charged with the responsibility of coming up with reasons to fire Director Comey. This morning, Politico was reporting that, quote, Trump had grown angry with the Russia investigation, particularly Comey admitting in front of the Senate that the FBI was investigating his campaign and that the FBI director wouldn't support his claims that President Barack Obama had tapped his phones in Trump Tower, end quote. As I reflect on the decision to dismiss Director Comey, I become incredulous thinking about the ongoing FBI investigation into Russia's interference with our presidential election and possible connections to associates of the Trump campaign and administration. One thing, Mr. Chairman, that, thinks, that sticks in my mind is the classified briefing that you and I had from Director Comey on March 15th. At this briefing, Director Comey outlined the counterintelligence and criminal investigations the FBI is conducting involving Russia's covert action to influence the presidential election. I can't go into the specifics, but you and I know that it was rather comprehensive for this kind of briefing. The uh, FBI director was precise and he presented us with substantial information. It was clear the FBI was taking its job seriously and that a substantial investigation was underway. In addition, just last week on May 3rd, Director Comey came before the Judiciary Committee and promised to update the committee and provide briefings on the Russia investigation in a classified setting as necessary. Then last night, CNN reported that federal prosecutors have begun taking additional steps in the Russia investigation in the past few weeks, including subpoenas to associates of Michael Flynn seeking business records as part of the Russia investigation. In fact, reporters learned 
that prosecutors were issuing subpoenas as part of the ongoing investigation into Russian interference in the election just hours before Director Comey was fired. At a minimum, the decision to fire Comey raises questions about the appropriateness and timing of firing the person in charge of an investigation that could, I won't say would, but could implicate the administration. To have this happen, and happen now, is beyond surprising. I believe it's important to have Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein and Deputy Director McCabe come before the Judiciary Committee and brief members on the reasons and the timing of the firing, as well as what steps are being taken to ensure this action will have no impact on the work of the FBI on the ongoing investigation. I also plan to work with Senator Blumenthal on legislation to ensure that a truly independent prosecutor can be appointed. However, while we work on that legislation, I want to renew my call to have a special prosecutor appointed to oversee the Russia investigation. I have said on some occasions now that we're in unusual times, and I recognize today's hearing is meant to be on the nominees who are before us for three important positions at justice. But given the events of the last 24 hours, I believe members should have the opportunity to speak out about these events. So, Mr. Chairman, I hope you allow other members to say a few words if they would uh, if they would like, but I want you to know I very much appreciate this courtesy. Thank you. you uh, Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to welcome uh, each of the three nominees who I've known a long time and consider each to be friends. Uh, but I have a particular honor and privilege of introducing my dear friend, Noel Francisco, uh, who has been nominated to be the Solicitor General of the United States. Noel is a lawyer's lawyer. Uh, and that matters because the Solicitor General is the only position in the entire federal government that is required by statute to be, quote, learned in the law. I, I am very glad that. There is no similar requirement for United States Senators. Noel and I service there, Noel came to earn the trust and respect of those two legendary jurists who relied on him for his sound judgment, skill, and legal analysis. After his clerkship, Noel came to work at Cooper and Carvin a small constitutional law litigation boutique here in Washington, D.C., where I was a baby associate working alongside Noel. There are many things that are obvious about Noel's record. He's brilliant. He's an incredibly talented lawyer. But he also has good judgment. Noel is very even-keeled. He's steady. Nothing rattles him. He's someone you want leading during a crisis. Noel is a veteran of the White House Counsel's Office and the Office of Legal Counsel. He is an experienced Supreme Court advocate, including arguing NLRB versus Noel Canning, where he defended the constitutional authority of this body, the United States Senate, to advise and consent on presidential appointments. He won that landmark case 9-0. Noel is universally well respected by Republicans and Democrats alike, because he's fundamentally decent. One of my favorite members of Noel is in the midst of major litigation, late at night, joining with him and another lawyer, arm in arm, reading aloud Shakespeare's St. Crispin's Day speech. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. Noel is joined today 
by his beautiful wife, Cynthia, who is a talented and incredibly capable lawyer in his own right. Indeed, they met as law clerks in the Fourth Circuit together. And they're two beautiful little girls who I can tell you, Noel and Cynthia, shower with love every day, and they are so proud of both of you. If confirmed, Noel will be the first Senate-confirmed Asian-American Solicitor General in our country's history, which is, I know, I know is a point of deep pride for many in that community. And I can tell you, Noel will make a terrific Solicitor General, and he will fulfill that role with skill, with principle, and with integrity. Uh, I've already uh, done what uh, was next on the agenda that I got a little ahead of myself. Uh, you're sworn in. So we'll go left to right. So, Mr. Francisco, uh, your opening statements and introduce uh, any of your family and friends that you, that's the tradition of this committee, and that would be true for all three of you. Go ahead. Uh, Chairman Grassley, members of the committee, thank you for taking the time to consider my nomination to be Solicitor General of the United States. I'd also like to thank President Trump and Attorney General Sessions for the trust they've placed in me in nominating me to the position of Solicitor General. And Senator Cruz, of course, thank you for that very warm introduction. Cynthia, the girls, and I are so uh, grateful to the friendship that you and Heidi have shown to us over the years. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Cruz has already introduced my family. I'm joined by my wife, Cynthia Francisco, of 18 years. This past Monday was actually our 18th wedding anniversary, so uh, happy anniversary, sweetheart. Uh, we've got our daughters with us, Caroline, who's uh, in the 10th grade at the field school, and Maggie, who's in the third grade at the Lowell School. I'm also joined by uh, my wife's father, Charles Stewart, and her stepfather, Edwin Spies, and my dear friend, former ambassador to Zimbabwe, Tom McDonald. My own family, my mother, uh, Therese Francisco, my brother, David Francisco, and my sister, Dina, couldn't join us today, but I am sure they're uh, watching this from home. Mr. Chairman, it's with a deep sense of honor and gratitude that I sit here today. My father, Nemesio Maurice Francisco, was born in the Philippines in 1935. He grew up amongst the ravages of World War II. He once told me how, as a young boy, he was forced to live in the remnants of a bombed-out tank. Whenever I face the joys or the difficulties of life, I think of that little boy. He could not possibly have dreamed that his son would one day have the high honor of sitting before this august body. And I am so grateful to you all for helping to fulfill what that scared little boy dared not dream. My father also brings to mind my hometown, a small city on the shores of Lake Ontario called Oswego, New York. A little known fact is that during World War II, Oswego provided refuge to almost 1,000 Jews fleeing Nazi Germany. To my knowledge, the only place in the country to do so. But those who know Oswego, and who know Oswegonians as we call them, would not be surprised. The good people of Oswego welcomed my father, a Filipino immigrant who barely spoke the language, with open arms. It is in Oswego that my father became and died an American. To me, Oswego will always represent the promise of this great nation. And that is why I am so honored, Mr. Chairman, to be here with you all today. The Office of Solicitor General plays a special role in our system of government. Its duty is to represent the citizens of this great land before the United States Supreme Court and thereby play a role in safeguarding the rights and liberties of which this nation is so justly proud. And in so doing, it serves at the intersection of all three branches of our government, a system of separated powers that our framers understood to be the surest bulwark of freedom. Unlike most attorneys in the executive branch, the Solicitor General owes responsibilities to all three branches of our government. The Solicitor General does, of course, serve as an attorney for the President and the Executive Branch. But he or she is also responsible for defending the laws passed by this body when they are challenged in federal court. And in so doing, the Solicitor General owes a special duty 
of independence and candor to the courts. After all, the Department of Justice's goal is not just to win, but to ensure that justice is served. If I am fortunate enough to be confirmed, it would be the greatest honor of my professional life to stand before the Supreme Court on behalf of the citizens of this great land. But more importantly to me, I could not imagine a better way to honor my father, the truest American that I ever knew. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I look forward to your questions. Mr. Al Rahim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, let me express my gratitude to you, Ranking Member Feinstein, and other members of the committee uh, who were given me the privilege of being before you today. Um, and also a special thanks to Senator Hatch, who gave me the great honor and the privilege almost 20 years ago to be here at the committee. <clears throat> uh, Senator, 38 years ago, I was a nine-year-old kid who would wake up in the middle of the night not in Iran, not speaking English, uh, to the sounds of machine guns, Allah Akbar, and death to America. Thirty years ago, I would help my dad uh, when we all moved here to the Los Angeles area in helping pump gas, change oil, and tune up cars, which I was very proud of. Twenty years ago, Senator Hatch gave me the great privilege of serving in this committee, which is one of the highlights of my career today. And today I, I sit here before you seeking your consent and very proud to be the president's nominee to head the antitrust division. My story is not unique, which is what's great about this country, but what is unique is this country. I don't think there's many other countries where that story could be told. Senator, if I could, with your permission, I have some of my family and friends here who have come here from far and near to show their support. First, my wife, Michelle, who's trekked last night from Los Angeles. Uh, my two sisters, Catherine and Katya. Katya is the deputy director of NIDA at the NIH and has dedicated her life to drug treatment. And my sisters from New York. I have my nephews, Jordan, Jared, and Alexa, uh, a couple of whom were happy to have taken the day off from Emory University to be here. Um, and I'm sad to say that my two sons and my daughter are still in Los Angeles, uh, Jake, Jonah, and Milana, who are not able to come here. Um, and I know that they will not let us live it down uh, to, to give them a couple of days off from school again. Uh, I wish they could be here. I have my uh, rabbi, the, the Kunin brothers, who are also my friends, and uh, Rabbi Fogelman, uh, uh, who has been a longtime friend of our families. Um, a lot of our colleagues, some of my colleagues from the Justice Department in my last tour, and some from the White House Counsel's Office, and I'm honored to be here with these two gentlemen who are friends and could not be better legal minds here. Uh, Senator, as I mentioned, it, it was a great privilege to be here. Uh, as the staff on the committee, uh, I know how hard the staff here work and the sacrifices they make. Um, and I thank them and others who served uh, before them for what they do in the public service. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I'm fortunate enough to be confirmed to this position, I'd be grateful for the privilege of leading the dedicated staff of the Antitrust Division in their important mission of preserving the, com the competitive markets and protecting the American consumer. I served as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in my last tour, as you have mentioned, and I know firsthand the important work that the Division engages in day in and day out. Busting cartels, pursuing and litigating cases, pursuing investigations, and enforcing the laws in, in, towards illegal competition. I learned a great deal during those years, as well as my years in private practice, and I'm looking forward, if I'm fortunate enough to be confirmed, to apply those to the antitrust division. The antitrust laws, vigorously and properly enforced, are the greatest protectors of the free market system that we know and we cherish in this country. 
hard-nosed competition free from inappropriate restraints leads to lower prices, higher quality of goods and services for the American consumer, and it also helps encourage technological innovation. The Supreme Court has recognized the Sherman Act as the Magna Carta of the free enterprise system. For these reasons, I fully appreciate the importance of the job at hand. Mr. Chairman, this committee often considers in its oversight role how and whether various markets are functioning properly and whether particular combinations from time to time may pose broader policy questions. The antitrust laws have been enforced at the Justice Department and overseen in this committee in a bipartisan manner. And I hope that continues. If I'm fortunate enough to be confirmed, I look forward to working with this committee in that great tradition to oversee the operations of the division and in a bipartisan manner, cooperate in any way to provide any technical advice the committee may need to work together to continue and improve our global competition system for the benefit of American consumers, businesses, and workers. Mr. Chairman, I cannot tell you how humble and honored I am to be here, to have this, uh, to have this privilege that the President and the Attorney General have bestowed on me, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Mr. Engel. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman Grassley. Ranking Member Feinstein and members of this committee, I'm honored to appear before you today. Thank you for scheduling this hearing and for meeting with me over the past few days. I want to thank Senator Graham for that generous introduction. Both of my parents are here today. I know they both appreciate it and hopefully at least one of them believe it. Uh, I'd also like to thank the President and the Attorney General for the confidence they have shown by entrusting me with the nomination to head the Office of Legal Counsel. And with the Chairman's permission, I'd like to introduce the members of my family who are here. Uh, first, my wife, Susan Engel. Susan and I first met when we clerked together for Judge Alex Kaczynski on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. I followed her the next year to the Supreme Court, where I clerked for Justice Kennedy when she clerked for Justice Scalia, who was himself former head of the Office of Legal Counsel. Susan is now a partner at Kirkland & Ellis in Washington, D.C., and one of the most gifted attorneys I know. I relied upon her judgment, her love, and her support in all of our endeavors. Behind me here are my three daughters. Uh, they are easy to see because they have picked matching dresses for the occasion. Uh, Brittany just turned 10 years old. Uh, Aiden is seven and Cameron is five. Uh, and this is not our family's only public event today. Uh, this afternoon, Aiden will be performing in her school's spring play. So this is a busy day for our family. Uh, and with us are my parents, as I mentioned, Mark and Joanne Engel, and my brother, Matt. My father has run a small business in the Bronx for nearly 40 years. My mother is a retired school teacher. They raised my brother and me on Long Island in the town of Port Washington, where they still live. My parents inspired us by their example, and they instilled in us their commitments to hard work, to education, and to service. Everything else has followed from that. I'm also proud to have with me another devoted mother and grandmother, my mother-in-law, Elsie Kearns, who has come down to the hearing from Larchmont, New York. Next to her is Susan's uncle, Judge John Codal, who appeared before this committee 23 years ago after President Clinton nominated him to serve on the Southern District of New York. Judge Codal has served with great distinction in the decades that have followed, and he is well known in New York as one of the hardest working judges on the bench. I am grateful, too, that he has found the time to come down to D.C. this morning. Mr. Chairman, I'm deeply honored to appear before this committee as the President's nominee to head the Office of Legal Counsel. The office plays a critical role in ensuring that ours remains a nation governed by laws. By delegation of the Attorney General, the Assistant Attorney General for OLC has the responsibility of advising the Executive Branch on the requirements of the law in order to fulfill the President's constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. It is vital to our government's commitment to the rule of law that OLC perform its mission well. OLC must provide candid, independent, and principled legal advice without regard to the aims of policymakers. OLC does not get to choose the legal questions it receives. They are often some of the most pressing and difficult questions facing the executive branch. These are questions, as Justice Jackson famously observed, 
that may involve a surprising degree of poverty of really useful and unambiguous authority. Yet while the office must advise on the questions of the day, its opinions must go beyond the day's expedience. The office must do its job by reference to the requirements of the law and the long-term interests of the executive branch and our structure of government. These things are easier said than done, but it is critical that they be done. And it is the culture of the office and the Department of Justice that ensures that the office maintains the perspective and independence necessary to perform that work. I had the privilege of serving before as a deputy in the Office of Legal Counsel. I have the deepest respect for the office and its proud traditions. The office has been home to some of the brightest and most devoted lawyers to have served in our government. Some of them are still there now. The lineup of those who have headed the office, which includes Supreme Court justices and attorneys general, is as inspiring as it is humbling. If I am fortunate enough to be confirmed, I pledge to this committee that I will honor these standards of integrity, independence, and professionalism. I will discharge these responsibilities with the aim of serving as a faithful steward of the office so as to preserve and build its reputation and to pass on the office stronger to its future leadership. I thank the committee for its time today, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, Mr. Francisco, uh, the Solicitor General is tasked with the responsibility of representing the United States, the federal government before the Supreme Court. It's the responsibility of the Solicitor General to defend the law even when they don't personally agree with that law. Will you be able to defend this nation's statutes regardless of ideology, or regardless of whether or not you personally agree with the statute itself? Absolutely, Senator. Uh, the Solicitor General is a lawyer representing the United States. What matters are the views expressed by the United States in the statutes that this body passes, which the Solicitor General is obligated to defend whenever a reasonable argument can be made in their defense, save that very narrow category of cases that implicate the President's own Article II powers. That's the standard that the office has always applied. That's the standard that I would apply should I be lucky enough to be confirmed. Okay. Uh, Macon, some of your antitrust experience comes from representing clients in the private sector, which is quite common for individuals nominated for the position you have. For example, the last two Ob Obama appointees represented large tech and media conglomerates in the antitrust matters. Their clients included companies like Comcast, General Electric, Netscape, and eBay. Because you, like others who have led the antitrust division, have had clients in the private sector, conflicts may arise. If confirmed, what recusal policy would you follow to avoid conflicts? Uh, Senator, did I take the recusal and the uh, ethical obligations of this, of this job very seriously. Uh, as has been the tradition, I would consult with uh, the career ethics officials of the department as well as the antitrust division and recuse myself both in accordance to the law uh, and the ethics pledges uh, that I have committed to. Uh, you have represented Anthem on an antitrust matters before Currently, their merger with Cigna is in ongoing litigation. If confirmed, will you recuse yourself from investigations and department action involving Anthem? Uh, Senator, I, I, am, uh, I will be recused. I've recused myself from the Anthem-Cigna merger. Um, I, have, uh, I understand it is now on appeal to the Supreme Court, um, and we will see what happens, but I will be recused from that matter. Mr. Engel, you've been nominated to serve as head of the Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, we had a Deputy Attorney General and Acting Attorney General Sandy, uh, Sally Yates before this committee. Uh, 